A few people died yesterday while two others sustained minor injuries when bandits attacked the advanced team of security guards, protocol and media officers ahead of President Muhammad Buhari's Salah trip to his hometown in Dora, Kassina State. The presidency has since described the dastardly act as a sad and an unwelcome development. This is as bandits again yesterday ambushed and killed an assistant commissioner of police ACP Aminu Omar Dayi in charge of for Tusimana area in command in Kassina. Following a fierce gun duel in a release last night by presidential spokesman Malanga Bashehu, the presidency disclosed that a few people died while two persons who sustained injuries during the attack were already receiving treatment. But other personnel, staff and vehicles made it safely to Dara, the statement added. Relatedly, suspected terrorists last night attacked the Kujie Correctional Center in Abuja. The Kujie Mediums Prison Facility came under attack at about 10.20 p.m., when what was suspected to be a high-caliber bomb went off, followed by two more explosions and ensuing sporadic gunfire that sent residents scampering for safety. Although there was no official confirmation yet, it was suspected that terrorists had launched a ferocious attack on the prison, which triggered a firefight with security forces. The staff of the prison reportedly confirmed the attack, saying that the attackers came from the back of the prison. A security report issued earlier had alerted the prison officials of possible attack of the medium prison. A lot to talk about this morning, Tundu. Sad ones. It's really, truly devastating. And may the souls of those who suddenly and violently lost their lives in these attacks find rest. It's just a repetitive phenomena, isn't it? People mm. getting killed, murdered in cold blood in this country. With regards to what happened in Katsina, with the convoy of the president being ambushed, it's not the first time that bandits have, or terrorists have taken the opportunity of a presidential visit to his home state to make a statement. Because I do believe, obviously the investigations are ongoing, but I don't think this group of terrorists accidentally happened upon this advanced convoy of the president. I think it must have been planned, which suggests that there might be a mole. A lot of investigations need to continue in this regard. But the point to be stressed here is the message that they are sending across, which is that nobody is safe and that this has been tolerated in Nigeria. This message has been coming loud and clear. This is not the first attack when the president is visiting his home state. So this is no accident. That is the president's home state really on the eve of Salah. So it's a slap in the face to the federal government, quite frankly, and a slap in the face to the citizens of this country, that none of us are safe and we can all just be picked off at will at any time. And then we now come to this other audacious attack on Kujie prison, not for the first time. I recall a similar incident like six years ago, but from the current reports that we're hearing now, this attack is far worse because what's been reported is that 150 terrorists criminals and what have you, have escaped from the prison. That is extremely alarming. Initial reports also suggest that high-profile prisoners, such as the former super cop Abakiari, are still in situ. He did not escape. But it's so horrific to imagine this another failure of intelligence because they were warned, security agencies were warned that this attack would happen and really nothing was done. The attack did happen and then we're now going to have some kind of reaction, people scrambling around trying to rearrest, and mm -hmm. we're going to have the usual people coming out, the usual suspects are going to come out to issue dire warnings to these escapees saying you better come back within 24 hours or we're going to get you and then nobody gets gotten. So it just <laughs> looks yet again like a slap in the face of our government, like egg on the face of our government, the federal government of Nigeria, is looking clownish at this point because of the repetitive nature of these attacks, the repetitive nature of the complete ineptitude in bringing the people who are guilty of these attacks to justice. And it's just quite sickening at this point. You know, when you were saying some suspect will come out and say, come back to the prison, we're counting one, two, three, felt like playing hide and seek, come back one, Come back two, come back three, and like he's using your words, we've become clownish as a nation. It's sad, it's sickening, words fail me. And you know, it's even more debilitating when people make the arguments that things have improved as regards security in the country. I ask, in the past in this country, did we ever have incidents where they attacked the presidential convoy or an advanced convoy. Correct me if I'm wrong. No. I ask again, 
Insecurity is improving so much. But we have killings. In the northeast alone, close to a thousand people have died in the first half of the year. Many attacks. Increasingly, we have priests being attacked now. So it's as if if you wear a cassock now, you're in trouble in this country. We've got everybody being attacked. Now, the presidential convoy being attacked. And you see, it's the way we even react to things like this. I mean, I would have thought that we would have stopped all of this. Because I don't want to believe that these bandits are more powerful than the Nigerian states. They are not. I don't want to believe that they have the monopoly of violence over the Nigerian states. And this is why I will call on the Nigerian states to show that it has more monopoly of violence over these bandits. We cannot have bandits run amok. And that's what's happening everywhere. And they even have audacity to attack the presidential convoy. It's not done. And when you see that happening, like you said, it's a statement. It's an indication that we are so bold we can make a go for any convoy in this country. The other day, somebody was telling me that, that Rufai, it's even bad now when you have a convoy with you because it attracts attack. So they want to go head on. And that's the country we've built. I would like to give tributes, you know, because I, I, I'd like to balance things out. I'd like to give tributes to the assistant police commissioner that was killed. I hear he was a nightmare to terrorists and bandits. And he's a true hero this morning that lost his life. He lost his life in a gun duel trying to save the nation. It's people like that that still make us believe in the police force that are committed to this country. And I hear that when he died, there was celebration in the camp of the bandits. So he must have given them a tough time. So this morning, he's passed. My commiserations to his family. But I will not mourn him. I would celebrate him. Because in things like this, when a nation is under siege, when you see true heroes that lay down their life for their country, it's good you celebrate them. So I celebrate that Stand Commissioner of Police this morning. And I thank him for all his service to the country. But we need to do more. And concerning all of this, I'd like to quote the book of Proverbs 14, 34 this morning. That says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And I'll quote it again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, what will exalt Nigeria is when we do things rightly. When we tackle the security situation rightly, when all hands are on deck to tackle these problems. I mean, like you said, people can't just attack a presidential convoy. There must be information prior to this time that the convoy was coming through. There must be a mole somewhere. And the CDS did confirm that, in fact, if there's any mole, we're trying to sweep them out. So what can we do? to stop even having moves or reduce the number, even if we can't stop them totally. And it goes back to righteousness. When we see these moves, do we put them out of the force? Do we take care of them or push them out? Or we leave them because the interest suits us. Righteousness, exalt a nation. Righteousness, when the government ought to do for the people, did they do it? What have we done to tackle poverty in this country? It makes it so easy for anybody to carry a weapon. The money is given to local government officials. What do they do with it? Did they help the people? Did they clear the drainage? Did they build hospitals in there? Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach. Because the offshoot of the unrighteousness consistent over the years, and it's not only this government, it is over the years in Nigeria. Albeit since the days where we discovered crude oil. Where they, we had so much to spend and corruption started. It is the scene that is a reproach that we're seeing the offshoot now. That we can't have accountability in our governance. We can't take care of internal bandits. So what if we had an external aggression? How are we going to take care of it? Well, we won't. 
Quite That's clearly. what it shows. So we can't secure our homeland next to nothing, homeland security. And all of this points to us that verse I quoted. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. And this is a word for everybody out there. Let's do things rightly. Let's help build our country. Let's shun sin. Let's shun all the terrible, terrible things that we do that could be inimical to the growth and development of our country. And as I close, I'd also say this, like Dwight Eisenhower said. He said, a leadership that values privilege over virtue will soon lose both the privilege and the virtue. A leadership that values privilege over virtue will soon lose both the privilege and the virtue. And that's what's happening. If we have a leadership class that just values the privilege of being in power, rather than the virtue of changing society and making society better, we'll soon lose that privilege. And also, then the virtue of society will be eroded. We live in a country where virtue is eroded in our society. And that's why leaders must start thinking of the next generation, not the next elections in Nigeria. I just hope we hear and we do what is right for our country. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach. Uh, we'll move to the next story this morning. Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, Mohamed Sanusi Barakindo, is dead. His death was announced on Twitter in the early hours of Wednesday by NMPC GMD Melekiari, who described his departure as a great loss to his immediate family, NMPC Nigeria, OPEC, and the global energy community. Though the cause of his death was not disclosed in the tweet, Barakindo was received at the State House on Tuesday by President Muhammad Buhari, who lauded the outgoing OPEC Secretary General's six-year tenure and described him as a worthy ambassador of Nigeria. Let's watch a video of him speaking just yesterday at the Oil and Gas Summit in Abuja before we come back for a chat. The policy narrative in the run-up to and during COP26 last year in Glasgow, UK, was heavily distorted against hydrocarbons and divorced from the reality of the world's energy needs. Developing countries were urged to turn their backs on their own hydrocarbon assets, even though their right to sovereignty over the use of their natural resources is carved in the Paris Agreement's principle of equity in the context of sustainable development. Efforts to unwisely encourage divestment in the hydrocarbon industries are unfortunately becoming more pronounced lately. Population will increase by 20% from now to 2045, bringing the total number of human souls on this planet to about 9.5 billion people. 9.5 billion people. Secondly, the global economy as we know it today, despite all the challenges coming out of COVID, the size of the global economy will more than double, with more than double by 2045. At the moment, the projection is about 125 trillion US dollars using the 2017 purchasing power parity. So this would be multiplied by two beyond in 2045. The combined effect of all this is increased demand of energy, all sources of energy, including oil and gas. Oil alone, we project, will grow by 28% between now and 2045. Therefore, this world will continue to be thirsty for energy, will continue to be thirsty for oil and gas. Therefore, it is ill-advised for anyone to suggest that to achieve our climate target of capping global temperature rises at 1.5 degrees Celsius, as we agreed in Paris, oil and gas should be discontinued. This is unscientific, it is not supported by the data and the facts. The biggest challenge before us is how should we deploy technology 
and appropriate policies to address carbon emissions, not about switching from one source of energy to another. Both conventional, non-conventional energy sources will be required for the foreseeable future. I therefore use the opportunity, the platform of the Nigeria Oil and Gas Hmm. This is such shocking news. That was Mohamed Bakindo just yesterday advocating for the oil and gas industry, as he has been doing, serving and representing Nigeria since 1991, because he was in the United Nations delegation for climate change in 1991. Obviously, Secretary General of OPEC before that, acting Secretary General of OPEC, a distinguished Nigerian who passed on yesterday unexpectedly at 11 p.m., we're told, last night at the age of 63, very young to have passed on. We just pray that his soul finds eternal rest and may his family be comforted. He had a really distinguished career. I mean, he had qualifications from Amadou Bello University, University of Washington, Oxford University, and an honorary degree from Federal University of Technology in Yola. And he really did make his mark on the oil and gas industry. It's really shocking news. I mean, really very shocking news. I think it's a sad blow to the energy sector all over the world. I mean, he was just completing his tenure. And uh, a lot of people said a lot was awaiting him in the future, you know, in the advisory space for the energy uh, sector in Nigeria, you know, at a critical time where there's a talk about transitioning, but there's also a big argument on the table that we can't leave the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, we, it, yeah we can't just move away from oil like that. And... And that's what I keep saying, that the likes of Alok Sharma and their climate change conference, yeah, which is all good talk. But if for anything, the war in Ukraine and Russia has shown us a lot, that you still need that proper energy mix. And for the foreseeable future, for the next up to 2050, 2060, oil is still going to make a dominant part because it's gradually where you will ease things off. Yeah, some nations have gone faster than the other, you know, in terms of the transition to cleaner forms of energy, the likes of Norway and the likes, you know, Norway has got, I think in the year 20, 2022, no, 2020, 2021, over 84% of the newly registered cars in Norway were electric vehicles. And some people will make arguments of countries like Norway, but the counter argument is countries like Nigeria still needs an energy mix. We're still here. We still need to sell our petrol to be able to develop. And those were the arguments, you know, Barakindo always made in his lifetime, which is very sad now. God, you know, rest his soul. That countries like us still need that energy to be able to survive. We still need to sell our oil and gas. We still need to burn our oil, possibly. We still need to use our gas to fire our factories and the likes. We still need to industrialize. And probably we still need to even look at coal, you know, as a source of energy. Of course we do. Yeah, we still need to look at coal because we are not at the level of those developed countries. And the reality is quite different. And they are going back to coal, aren't they? And they are as going back to coal. Look at, look, at, look at what is happening in Russia and Ukraine. Germany is going back to coal. They've opened their coal fire plant again. And so they still have these things, you know, at, uh, on, on the side and they can always go back to it. And those were the very fair arguments, you know, he made. Uh, Astute, astute, I, I must have to say technocrat, you know, made the right, you know, uh, noises in, 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 while, while it was in OPEC, you know, made all the right arguments for Nigeria. You know, it was pretty much under a stirring that we had this new quota system, you know, uh, that, that has characterized the world now as it is, as regards, you know, putting out uh, crude oil to the market because of the crisis here and there. And, you know, during this time, you know, it took a tough stance as regards, you know, energy policies, in parts of Africa and other parts of the world. And, and that was what he stood for. And it's very sad that we're losing such a you know, great thinker and technocrat at a point like this in time. And most importantly, you know, God, God, rest his fam uh, God rest his soul and God be with his family at a point in time like this. And it is a big loss to the energy sector. Big, big loss, I must have to say. And, and not at a time like this. Not at a time like this. Where decisions need to make, be made as regards energy mix in Nigeria. Not at a time like this. Uh, that's all on the headlines. It's time for a short break when we return at this hour, bringing us COVID-19 updates. Stay with us. For updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua is here with us. Adesua, great to have you. Good morning to you. 
Good morning, Rufai, and good morning, children. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good to be here again. Well, let's look at those figures. For good morning. We are missing Dr. Abati this morning. Job, ah. The work calls in Ocean State ahead of the election. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So let's look at the figures very quickly. According to Johns Hopkins University, 551 million infections, 11.7 .7 billion vaccine doses, and at least 6.3 million deaths have been recorded so far. Uh, any moment from now, we should have the weekly breakdown, courtesy of the WHO epidemiological report. Then we'll be able to tell the movement of the pandemic in the last one week. Remember that in the previous week, we've been told that at least 110 countries are now seeing an increase, no thanks to the Omicron BA4 and BA5 variants, which are now dominating uh, those infections around the world. Well, here in Nigeria, we also don't have the latest figures because, again, the Nigerian government is reporting those figures three times in a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So as soon as we have those figures, we'll bring them to you. However, when it comes to vaccination, over 21% of the targeted population, eligible targeted population in Nigeria have not been fully vaccinated, while 10.7% are partially vaccinated, meaning they've received one of the two-dose regime of vaccines available in the country. The NPHCDA says Kano and Nasrawa states account for 32% of the entire booster doses that have been administered so far in Nigeria. It also says a number of states has improved its fully vaccinated performance from the 31st position to the 29th position in just seven days. So it's doable. People can roll up their sleeves and get these jabs in their arms. And of course, we increase uh, the number of those who are immune from this virus. And away from Nigeria to Canada, where the country will dispose of 13.6 million doses of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine because it cannot find any takers for it either at home or abroad. The Canadian government signed a contract with AstraZeneca in 2020 to get 20 million doses of its vaccines and 2.3 million Canadians were inoculated with it. Uh, mostly between March and June 21. Since then, it's been struggling. The country moved to the mRNA vaccines of the Pfizer and Moderna. And so this has been abandoned. They tried to send it out to people, but no one is taking it. So 13.6 million vaccine doses are going to waste in Canada. It's something we are seeing in different parts of the world. To so Saudi Arabia, guys, uh, some 1 million people are expected to be in attendance in the holy city of Mecca in the Grand Mosque, particularly for the start of the five-day ritual. Well, that's a large jump from last year when we saw only 60,000 pilgrims uh, permitted to partake in the ritual. In 2020, during the height of the pandemic, uh, eh, pandemic's early waves and before we even got uh, vaccines against this virus, Saudi allowed only 10,000 pilgrims uh, to partake in this uh, Hajj. However, uh, let me tell you that these visuals you're seeing on your screen were sent in by Nigerian pilgrim to me some five hours ago. The Ministry of Interior says masking will no longer be needed in closed spaces except in the Grand Mosque. This is the Grand Mosque. And as you can see, guys, you can hardly find anyone with a face mask uh, there. Uh, organizers also say that festivals and events in the city can choose to enforce mask mandates if they like. Uh, but that's the situation. Uh, restrictions are being dropped across the globe. It's difficult. I think a lot of people are just COVID fatigued. So you can find this uh, restrictions in place so much anymore. And finally, let's go to China, where parts of the Asian city of Xi'an, home to 13 million people, has gone into a seven-day lockdown. Officials say businesses, schools, and restaurants were closed for one week after the city logged 18 COVID-19 cases since Saturday. They're shutting down the city of 13 million people for 18 COVID cases. But this, is a, this again, is not new with China. It's something we've seen. Meanwhile, residents of parts of Shanghai and Beijing have been ordered to undergo further rounds of COVID-19 tests uh, following discovery of new cases in the two cities. An outbreak in China's largest city is actually linked to a karaoke bar where the officials refuse to enforce uh, measures. And so people will have to undergo testing in those two cities. While in Jian, 13.6 million people are under lockdown. Remember that Shanghai has just emerged from a strict lockdown uh, for just, uh, and, and Shanghai has about 24 million people. So 
So there are fears that, you know, this lockdown and this round of testing will be harsh and affecting not just the livelihoods, but again, the economy, just something we're just coming out from. And I'm sure Michael Wilson and Rotus would have told you a lot about that. Back to you guys. Thank you, Adis. Well, I mean, China is clearly committed to the zero COVID policy, which we've discussed at length here at this one, including its adverse effects. But I can't help but wonder what could have happened yeah. in the world from November 2019 to December 2019 if China had had this kind of approach to Wuhan, the epicenter of this complete cataclysm that befell the world. But no, they were busy trying to silence doctors, if you recall initially, trying to deny that a pandemic was about to yes. break forth from their own shores. If they had done this right off the bat, millions of people around the world would still be alive today. Families that have been devastated by COVID would not have had to experience that. And I just really have that thinking with China that they just completely blew this. But China did let the genie out of the bottle, as it were. They let the virus travel around the whole world. And the, the rest of us here are not really helping things by refusing to get vaccinated. This story from Canada really is infuriating. The scientists came through, they performed miracles, moved mountains, actually got us vaccines, not just one. We have options such that you could even have your top tier vaccines in some people's minds. I don't agree. Like the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer. And some people think um, AstraZeneca vaccine is like a second class vaccine. You recall the bad press that AstraZeneca's vaccine got as a result of Brexit, how politics affected the reputation of that vaccine because of um, Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron throwing little tantrums because Britain left the European Union. And that has affected sort of the marketing of the AstraZeneca vaccine. But I also remember Canada, supposedly the nicest country in the world. They have a culture of kindness in their country. But they were most unkind with their hoarding during the initial stages of the vaccine rollout. It was shameful. They were getting called out left, right, and center, the Canadian government, for their greed, frankly. And now look, they now have too many vaccines and now cannot find any takers. And what do the rest of us get? We get different variants. We get scary variants that are continuing to defy the vaccines that should have put this um, stops this COVID pandemic in its tracks. So it just goes back to the same point. Everybody should please just get vaccinated. As for the pictures from Hajj, I noticed that I did. So I was playing spot the mask and there was hardly a mask in that mask. I wonder what that's about because up until now, the Saudi authorities have actually handled the COVID pandemic perfectly because they did shut down when they were supposed to shut down. They didn't play politics with the lives of people. They didn't play the religious card, unlike what we saw in India with the fiasco that was the super spreader Kumela event. And we know what happened there because um, Modi wanted to get a few votes. People had to die for that. So I hope the Saudi authorities maintain that level that they started because we, they were congratulated across the world. We don't want to hear of any super spreader events coming from Hajj. I mean, I, I did swear, but are you surprised? Be more correct, Tindu. I did swear, but are you surprised that Canada decided to bean 3.6 million vials of vaccine? Are you surprised? I mean, if for anything, COVID has shown us that some have food, some can eat but have no food, and some have no food at all. And that's the way the world works. The rich nations and the poor nations. The rich nations that care about their people and the poor nations that don't care about their people that steal from their people. It's absurd, it's painful that Canada had to waste these vaccines. But the truth is, what have we done concerning our healthcare sector? What have we done? What have we done to improve our healthcare sector? Did COVID even teach us any lesson? No, we didn't learn. I'm sure if you take an analysis that the Nigerian healthcare sector has gone back probably to pre-COVID levels, how many ventilators do we have across the country today? Okay, maybe a couple of ventilators have increased. But is it holistic enough? Have we changed things? Have we made more investments? No. But the rich nations, because they've made investment over the years and they keep making investments, they have more than enough to eat. So I think it comes back to our leaders. So it's a great thing. Yeah, we can feel sad about it, but it comes back to our leaders. What have they done to the Nigerian people? And how can we improve these sectors? Because yesterday at this one, we're talking about Ghana. 
Ghana's national debt has increased so much that each Ghanaian will pay 18,000 CDs if they have to share the debt amongst them. But guess what? Across the pond, there's a country called Norway. That same country had oil just like Nigeria. And the Norwegians invested in a sovereign wealth fund for Norway. And if they are to share the 1.5 trillion sovereign wealth fund, in Norwegian will get $250,000. So that's to show you that the reason why we are asking for COVID-19 vaccine, the reason why we've not done a lot for our continent and ourselves is because we've got poor leadership that doesn't even think of the people. So the Western nations will always remind you that, hey, I'm richer and better than you. The question is, with the resource Africa has got, when are we going to change the paradigm? When are we going to turn things around? And it cuts across every sphere of life. Now it's COVID. They'll show you in other regards. It is sad we feel pained. But the question is, even with the vaccines we got here in Nigeria, this world, have we been able to vaccinate people effectively? No. What have we done? Are some of those vaccines not expiring? Didn't we see how Lagos has now got into number six position in the vaccination list? And Lagos is the epicenter of COVID-19 in Nigeria. Haven't we seen what has been done? Nothing. Have they pushed the vaccine so much that it gets into the arms of the people? Have they incentivized the people to get the vaccine? No. So even with all the donations, we have an abundance of vaccines. Out of a population of over 200 million. Yes. Correct me if I'm long, wrong. Has 30 million Nigerians have gotten the COVID-19 jab, first and second dose? No. No. So... Let's keep deceiving ourselves and let's keep crying. Oh, yeah, Canada's been vaccines. We should start looking inwards. There's a lot we can do for ourselves. And we've been blessed with all the prerequisite resource necessary for us to grow. That's just it. Thank you so much, Adeso, for your time. Yeah. Uh, uh, from COVID-19 updates, thank you so much and have a great day. We go for Global Business Update. Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Michael, great to have you. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, um, recession fears hanging over uh, everybody globally. Uh, and, of course, the, the resignations of two very senior cabinet ministers uh, in the UK, once again pointing towards whether Boris Johnson can survive this or not. That's the real question. Is it fatal or not? Now, as you've been hearing, um, Greater China... Um, stock markets led losses of over those COVID concerns resurging. Asia Pacific relatively low. I'll come on to oil right at the end of the report. Hong Kong Hang Seng slipping about 1.3. Uh, big, big, heavy, big banks and techs falling there. Mainland China dis declined, as I said. Shanghai Composite down about 1.3%. Um, and those new rounds of COVID testing and COVID lockdowns in Shanghai have actually increased fears of further lockdown in China. You've just been hearing about that. And, and we'd, we'd be wondering about the ripple effects that that would have on other markets. Let's turn our attention to the United States. Back from the Independence Day holiday yesterday, a big... Um, a big comeback, really, although, I mean, it's very difficult to understand what's going on, particularly just looking at the markets, because there, there, there've got to be recession fears in the United States. But low, but the, the idea of lower, lower interest rates somehow boosting technology stocks, now that's not going to last either, is it? Clearly, as the Fed is, is going to be fairly aggressive. But that's, that, that's really what it was about yesterday. The markets dropped four of the past five weeks. S&P is more than 20% below its uh, its record high and, ec and economists are now independently believing that the US economy shrank for both quarters to start the year and by anybody's terms that means a recession at least technically it means a recession probably people in the street would actually uh, disagree with that and say we've been going through these problems for a long time uh, and and th here's a note from Nomura many of the world's leading economies will fall into a recession in the next uh, 12 months um, the, the the only policy that central banks have is tightening uh, monetary policy right now and 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 again you know they are going to have to act aggressively says Nomura because it's too precious an asset 
to lose their monetary policy. So we're talking about they expect recessions in the euro area, UK, Japan, South Korea, Australia and Canada, as well as the United States next year. The EU, uh, the euro has slid to a 20 year low against the dollar as recession fears um, are building there. The euro fell to its lowest level for two decades on Tuesday as fears of a recession in the in the eurozone ramp up. Gas prices soaring. Euro shed about one and a half percent. Remember eurozone inflation up 8.6 percent in June. Um, and that prompted the European Central Bank to increase its, its view that there will be an interest rate rise in July. There's been a Norwegian oil strike. The government have stepped in there. Do we think it's the end of that? Well, the markets don't, don't think it is. Um, it's likely to be a temporary respite above um, anything else. So to the UK then. So the Chancellor and uh, the Health Secretary have both uh, resigned. That happened last night in protests against the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Is his leadership finally on the brink? Lots of people think it will be. Um, Brit the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, resigned uh, last night, saying the government, the government should be run properly, competently and seriously. And most importantly, he felt that his approach to the economy was fundamentally too different to that of Boris Johnson. Um, this is uh, all predicated on the fact that they were, had he stayed in office, planning a joint speech on the economy next week, and they couldn't agree its contents. Health Secretary Sajid Javid also uh, went, he was also previous, the previous finance minister as well. Um, and later on, later on Tuesday evening, Johnson named Nadim Zahawi, former Education Secretary, as the new Chancellor. He's just, just before we came on air, he was just giving one of his first interviews and he's saying that um, he was very evasive about any plans that he'd got. He said his major task was to rebuild the economy. Uh, everybody in, in, the, in the country wants to know whether this means tax cuts in the near future. He refused to be drawn on that. What about this big economic statement next week? They do need to say something fairly quickly. Sterling down to 119 against the dollar. That's where it was before all this. It hasn't moved um, a, a great deal. The highest inflation rate in the G7 and all the rest of it. Now, if you add to that, the deputy governor of the Bank of England speaking before all this political turmoil yesterday was saying that growth, as far as he's concerned, will be flat in 2023 in the UK and that the, the bank will do whatever is necessary, as they put it, to keep inflation down. He thinks, he thinks, that households could um, could withstand an interest rate of five percent and above. I don't know whether that gives any direction to where the Bank of England thinks it's going. We're looking at maybe three percent by the end of the year. But he feels that with uh, with, <coughs> with with the kind of help that the economy was getting during the pandemic. Um, and, and also uh, um, and also caps on mortgages, in other words, long term fixed rate mortgages, um, the households will be able to survive. So it looks it looks going to be fairly, fairly difficult year next year. Um, as far as travel is concerned, you don't need me to tell you that, that as far as this country is concerned, there's going to be travel chaos over the summer. British Airways have now cancelled um, more than twelve and a half thousand flights. There's also going to be a fueling strike between the 21st and the 24th of July. To the supermarkets and um, <laughs> there have been security um, things, the security tickets on packs of Lurpak butter, which are getting over about £9 for a kilo. Um, three quarters of a kilo is now £7.25. A lot of people were saying that that was, that that was, that that was too much and shoppers were wondering where to go to get their butter because obviously it's a staple here. Um, the <coughs> Lurpak are saying it's, it's too protect the farmers who are fa who are facing uh, huge increases in the cost of fertilizer and so on um, i told you that the the country's largest supermarket tesco was taking on heinz and its baked beans and all the rest of it now it's turned its attention to mars pet care over the price of cat food yeah um and shareholders uh, although th th there are shareholders in the company i think mars will probably win on this because they are actually probably quite big and the margins that uh, pet food this kind of operating margin about 15 percent tesco on about nine percent um if that uh, so I, th I think that obviously you were asking me who i thought would win against heinz i suspect tesco will probably prevail against mars very very different matter i would imagine and finally <coughs> oil 
tumbling uh, around about 10 percent. It got down to below $100 a barrel yesterday on the recession concerns. I've just been talking about um, I won't necessarily go through the prices with you because they, they change. They change by the minute. But perhaps just as important, copper and gold, both big commodities. They also slumped overnight. Copper, particularly known as Dr. Copper in the business, because it does tend to give a pretty good indication of what's happening uh, in, in the rest of the world. And as far as industrial output is concerned and predicted industrial output is concerned as well, the copper and gold, both uh, both both falling overnight. Uh, Gold down to 1780 an ounce, um, and palladium uh, down to um, palladium is 1909 this morning. Um, it was trading at $3,400 an ounce earlier in the year. That's the global view. Politics, recession, a terrible witch's brew of, of not, not very good things this morning, I'm afraid. A witch's brew indeed. I know you don't like to be drawn on into politics, so I'll wait to discuss this with Mr. Fenny and also catch the blockbuster PMQs later on today. But I want your take on this newspaper headline that I'm seeing. Boris fights on, declaring, I'm now free to cut taxes. The implication there, of course, is that he was somehow being prevented from cutting taxes by Rishi Sunak. So what's your take on that blame, blame game there? And also Zawahi's agenda. OK, uh, so we, well, I've, I've just been listening to Zahawi being being interviewed and his main agenda is called rebuilding the economy. He's been refusing to be drawn about tax cuts and so on. Um, and he, he kept stressing it's not even hasn't even finished his first day uh, in, in office, but he's promised to be open and transparent. So that clearly is a swipe. Um, at, at the Prime Minister, who still manages to hang on. There is a strong history in this country of conflict between number 10, the Prime Minister's place in Downing Street, and number 11, the Chartered Exchequer, the Finance Minister's um, official uh, official home in Downing Street. It's been going on for years. Uh, Lawson, Howe, Gordon Brown versus Tony Blair, these fights have been going on for years. I suspect you've got the politicians saying, well, you've got to deliver tax cuts, and the Chancellor who's in charge of the purse string saying, well, actually, do you know what? We can't afford it because there's lots of other things going on. So he was extremely cautious. There is, there's no real light on what he's planning to do. Um, he, he, is a, he is a successful businessman. Um, he has only been in, in this sort of level of politics for, for about a year. Those who are on the side of the prime minister and on the side of the Conservative Party are saying high time that, you know, there was a reshuffle and that, you know, this is this clearing the decks for the for the big big things ahead. Um, it's very, very difficult to say. The, the, amount of, the, the amount of why doesn't he just go comment this morning is absolutely huge, as you can imagine, and as you've just quoted there. But, but clearly, there was a rift between number 11 and number 10. No big change there. The more cautious is the, was the finance minister, the less cautious the politician in the prime minister demanding tax cuts. Again, any, any, anything could happen. I think he's relatively right to keep his cards the new Chancellor Tahawi, uh, relatively uh, close to keeping his cards relatively close to his chest, because what else is he going to say? You'll also recall Sajid Javid as well. He also had to resign from Boris Johnson's cabinet as Chancellor. He was reappointed yeah. and now he's gone again. No, um, he's he's actually quite, I mean, what again, a lot of people are saying it's easy to walk and it's very, very difficult to stay you know it's it's the normal kind of things as you quite rightly said right at the beginning of all this that the blame game will continue I, I, but i personally personally i would much rather hear and 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 discover some specifics about how the, how this this new finance minister this new chancellor at nadim zahawi is going to put things right as far as the economy is concerned i think that's what we're all waiting for all right and uh, a lot of people are already saying no specific no great departure from the plans of Rishi Sunak. And some are saying, on the contrary, that Rishi left because of his own scandal with his wife and the status you know, of taxation and the likes. That's the main reason why Rishi left. He just used this as an advantage and an opportunity to be able to live. That's what a lot of people are arguing, that he had his own problems. But I also talk about inflation this morning by saying it proves us right that inflation, I mean, it, it proves us right that a recession had already occurred. Because when you look at the fact that inflation could not be stemmed, 
and a shrinkage of incomes of people and a shrinkage of the economy in general. It shows that those putting out the figures had been lying to us. They've just been pushing the evil days. And I put it to you this morning, Michael, that inflation is on full throttle, even in the UK. And damn the economic numbers coming out this morning. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, but I think all, all, all this is doing, uh, you're right, but all, all this is doing is, under, is, underly, is underlining what a dreadful thing inflation actually is. There are some, some economists like Japan, for example, that, that, were, that were preferring that to deflation, and they haven't really achieved that. But here, because we're such a small economy, because the labour market is so tight, the wages spiral, all the rest of it, all these things are conspiring against, against the economy. I would honestly prefer if, if the I, I, would, I would hope the Bank of England is the deputy governor of the Bank of England is correct when he's saying things will be flat in 2023 because anything like that I mean given given what we've been through let's just think about what we've actually been through the whole world has been through a pandemic China is still going through China is still maintaining this zero COVID policy that they have it doesn't matter what they think happens to the economy I you and I both say at the time, did we not, that really what politicians need to do is focus focus absolutely strongly on the economy because in the long term that's what counts now if it, it, you've heard what when my report about Nomura saying there's, there's going to be a recession honestly I, I feel there's a recession right now I don't need economists to tell me about yes. that I don't need the norm I don't think the people in the street do either I don't think they do in your country I don't think they do in Main Street in the United States I certainly don't think they do in Europe which has got all which in the EU rather which has got all of its own, own sort of problems and I think I don't we don't need telling about that here. But inflation is the worst thing. Inflation erodes savings. Inflation, inflation erodes wage gains, and and it and it and it, bur it burns at everything. I lived through it when it was 17% in this country. I have no, I, I have no, very, I was very young, I have very little memory of it then, and I was working in the public services at the time. But my goodness, it was it was really touch and go then. But we came through it. I think we'll come through this. Yes, certainly. I mean, the full quote from Shakespeare is, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by these sons of York. So there's always a way out of winter of discontent, summer of discontent, whatever the case may be. Always a silver lining. I'll maintain that. But I just wanted to add to Rufai's point. I think it's extraordinary that you have a chancellor of the Exchequer resigning and we don't have the usual image, do we, of the family or boxes, whatever, being moved out of number 11 Downing Street, the home and office of the chancellor of the Exchequer. Because, of course, Rishi Sunak has moved out already as a result of the public backlash about his wife's tax evasion or how else am I going to put it politely? I mean, the huge backlash about him having a green card and what have you. He's already moved out. So it does appear that he was already sort of on tenterhooks and it just took the slightest, you know, breeze and off he went. Well, I, 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 to be honest, I hadn't even thought about that uh, that that thing with, with his wife um, s since it really happened. I thought they had navigated that okay i think i think what what if, if you really i mean i'm guessing now what i think happened was that the that the prime minister and the chancellor had to agree on a speech next week about the economy and and the, neither of them could could agree certainly i feel that rishi sunak probably with his with his goldman sachs background with his merchant banker background thought enough enough is enough that there's and and also when we when we came off air yesterday there's, there was a lot of debate in this country about politicians saying look I can go on the media and I can talk about policies which we're doing now. I don't necessarily agree with them, but that's part of the job. What politicians were saying yesterday is, if, if I don't, if I don't trust, if I don't trust the prime minister, uh, and this is what it's all about. It's all about trust. If I don't trust that, I cannot, in all conscience, go on and defend something which is about lies and the rest of it. Policies are one thing, lies, deceit, not telling the truth, something else. Indeed. All right. All right. Thank you so much, you know, for your time, Michael Wilson, this morning. We'll take a short break now.
Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rotus Sidiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, uh, Rafai. Good morning Good to morning. all our viewers. Great interview with uh, P uh, Peter Obi. You, 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 you grilled him. You put him on the spot. And, you know, this is a call for all the candidates running for president to please make themselves visible to the yes. media. And, you know, you asked him about his manifesto, you asked him about all these questions, you, 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 you grilled him on a number of economic issues. So they should, you know, all the candidates should please make themselves available to talk to the, the media and talk to the people yeah. about the plans that they have. He, he said some very, you know, interesting things about the subsidy and so on and so forth. So great, great interview to, uh, for the both of you. Um, we start on some tragic news. Uh, Mohamed uh, Bakindo, uh, OPEC uh, uh, Secretary General, has passed away. He passed away, he was 63 years old, uh, apparently passed away last Last night at about um, uh, 11 p.m. Is, is what is understood. In fact, there's a tweet from a uh, group managing director of the NNPC, uh, Mele Kiari, uh, where he, uh, he announced uh, his, uh, his passing. Very shocking. Uh, out of nowhere, we still don't know the cause of, uh, of his passing. It's going to be greatly missed. Big figure in the oil and gas uh, sector. Let's look at that tweet uh, from, uh, from Melek Kiari. I think he sent that tweet. He sent the tweet out about 4 a.m. Yeah. So we lost our esteemed Dr. Mohamed Nasanusi Barkindo. He died by 11 p.m. yesterday, 5th July 2022. Certainly a great loss to his immediate family, the NNPC, our country, Nigeria, OPEC, and the global energy community. Uh, burial arrangements will be announced uh, shortly. So may his soul rest in peace. Hope to find out what what happened to him and he just had it was just you know gave a speech was it just yesterday, yesterday you know yesterday a long healthy speech he was talking so really shocking stuff um well the, look the i want to move to what's happened in the uk yeah um we've we've talked about why or the question has been asked why don't more nigerians you know, i guess in the, in the in political positions especially relating to the economy when scandals erupt or any other reason, why don't they resign, right? Um, Richie Sunak actually makes me, reminds me of Kemi Adeoshun. Funny enough, former Minister of, uh, of Finance here. Now, she left for other reasons, right? Um, but if you look at the reasons why he left office, um, it, it, the, the question comes up again as to why these resignations don't happen enough. Some, funny enough, as Nigerians are asking this question, the... Um, uh, Vice Chair of the Tory Party, Bim Afo, um, Afolami, who is, in, I don't know if it's irony or what, take a listen, he, he actually resigned on live television, I think it was yesterday, yes, I think we have, I think we have that, yeah, yeah. Should he say or should he go? Well, I can tell you that earlier on today, I went to the funeral of a very long-standing councillor in my constituency, much loved, not just because of his work as a councillor and as a mayor, but also because of what he did in the community more broadly and family and friends and a lot of the talk um, was about his deep integrity and the, what that means to people in this country, not just in my constituency, but across the country. And I think that what's been very sad over the recent allegations about um, the former Deputy Chief Whip and other things that have happened over recent weeks, that I just don't think the Prime Minister any longer has not just my support, but he doesn't have, I don't think, the support of the party or indeed the country anymore, and I think for that reason, uh, he should step down. You're a vice chairman of, yes. of the Conservative well, probably not Party. Up, probably not after having said that, but yes. All right. Well, let's see if you retain your position. You're not resigning as vice chair. Of the well, no. Look, Party. I think I have to. I think you, you have to resign. Right? You have to resign uh, because I can't serve um, right. under the prime minister. But I say that with regret because I think this government's done some great things. I think the prime minister's got a very strong legacy in a huge range of areas. But I just think that uh, when you've lost trust. Um, of people, uh, and the Prime Minister asked at the confidence vote to be given time to restore that trust, and I, I took that, um, as many others did in the party, but I think it's become clear, particularly after losing the support of two of his sort of closest cabinet colleagues, that I think the, you know, the time has come for him to stand down. Can you imagine a member of the Buhari administration coming on the morning show to announce that the president should resign? Somebody in his own cabinet. Can you imagine what, just, just and that's, again, Afolami is, can, yeah, can, can you, can you just, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's, 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 um, it's incredible stuff. The, ma the matter of accountability in this country, whether, I think, another thing that needs to be asked is, 
who holds whom accountable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and why there are so few resignations, whether or not you know, the, uh, people in power and leadership feel that they're accountable to the people, and then how their feet can be held uh, to the fire. But that, that was, the fact that that's a Nigerian coming out on air, on live television, to say that the person, the leader of his party should so step down, it really just struck me, and I just, that's what just the, this stream of consciousness just came forward. Let's move to the LCCI, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Now, this is another thing. They held a uh, media uh, discussion. They are, again, now look at this. They are sounding the alarm on the Nigerian economy. Is there any reaction to that? So they talked about debt. They talked about inflation. They talked about unemployment. They talked about every single thing that you and Peter Obi just talked about. But no insecurity. Nobody, there's no, look, the UK now is going through what they call a cost of living crisis. Nigeria has had a cost of living crisis literally since 2016, since mm -hmm. that first recession has mm -hmm. happened. If you look at it, we've had two recessions now in four or five years, mm -hmm. yeah, and no one bats an eyelid. It's, it's, the LCCI is sounding the alarm on the economy. The IMF has sounded the alarm on the Nigerian economy. The World Bank has sounded the alarm on the Nigerian economy. Last week, Fitch was sounding the alarm on inflation. There is just, it's almost, I don't know whether we're numb, whether we're, I mean, this is just another headline. I could come up with anybody else sounding the alarm. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to move the needle, even though there is a crisis that is taking place on the economy. It has the number of people falling into poverty, the number of people that cannot, you know, that, are, that don't have jobs, what it means for insecurity. That was the first thing Peter Obi said when he talked about the attacks on the president's convoy. Yeah. Yeah, you can it just, it's not, anyway. Um, we do have some good news. Um, good. White rhinos are moving back. They've been moved, moved back to Mozambique. Uh, so they've, after 40 years of being extinct there, they moved them from uh, South, South Africa back to Mozambique, one of their national parks. They are hoping that um, it brings up, you know, brings in tourism revenue to uh, to, to Mozambique. Uh, these are these animals have been impacted by poaching. Uh, they've been impacted by the, uh, the civil war that took place in Mozambique for so many years. So um, yeah, this is I think it's a forty year absence that Mozambique hasn't had any white rhino. So it's it, the main thing is tourism revenue, much needed dollars. Remember, Mozambique has that massive twenty billion dollar total LNG uh, mm. plant that has unfortunately. Been been suspended because of insecurity okay. so they need all the money they can get uh, this won't replace LNG money but at least it's tourism and and there and there you have it they should bring some white rhinos here so yeah, here from the gallery they mm -hmm. want some in Nigeria but with regards to um, Bim Falabi going on TV and saying that it's extraordinary in this yes. climate yeah. and Kemi Adiyashu stands alone in having resigned and being honest about her reasons for resignation. Right. Other people have resigned, a few others, I can think of Justice Tanko Mohammed. I can think of Bart Baba Naji, Lola. Right? Was Bart, yeah. Bart Naji? No. Well, well, he, he, was, he wasn't a... Yeah. He wasn't a remember he, no. Yeah, he, he was pushed, he was pushed out, right. Yeah. So Rami Baba Lola, but they did not say why they were resigning. Mm. She said why she was resigning and she was honest about it and it's important that you are. She was talking about sort of the dignity of the office and, you know, maintaining that. It's extremely important. I don't want to draw the next parallels between them. I'll just leave that as is. Right. Now, with regards to um, the sounding of the alarm falling on deaf ears, it is extremely worrying, especially when we can see in real time mm. what is happening to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. what they have had to endure as a country. And when you look at it, what is it really? Poor leadership has right. gotten the people into this hole where people, there's not one drop of fuel to mm -hmm. be found in Sri Lanka for love or money. People right. are sleeping in their cars. The next um, import is, what, 22nd or 23rd mm -hmm. of July right. from Qatar. And I'm thinking this could very easily be us. They were very reliant on tourism. Look at what happened. Terrorists completely destroyed their tourism industry. They mm -hmm. had recovered after their civil war, that Easter attack. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what is terrorism doing to our economy here right. in Nigeria? Exactly. So I'm watching Sri Lanka with horror and I really hope all our presidential candidates are as well because this could very easily be Nigeria obviously we pray it's not but yeah it, it could yes it very well could and like you said Tundu leadership is the problem look at Sri Lanka look at the Rajapaksa brothers Gotabaya and his brother they Worst ruined the country. country they fought a war which somebody prominently helped them to fight General Fonseca and they defeated the Tamil Tigers after that yes they had some revenue but there was government misappropriation. They didn't keep the revenue properly. They spent it mm. stupidly. 
both brothers kept themselves in power. It was so much. I started playing the game of yo-yo. This one will be prime minister at the point. This one will be president at the point. Gotabaya will be president at the point. That's uh, like, the um, other Rajapaksa. So they started, you know, gaming. That's gaming. Like Putin and Medvedev. Right? Medvedev. Yeah. Putin yeah. and so Medvedev were gaming, so gaming the people. Yeah. Gaming the people. Ridiculous. But in the end, yeah. they had to leave. But we've been here before. There was a point in this country where we had a lot of money. They said the problem was not money, but how to spend it. Mm. Yes, that was what Yakubu Gowa said in the 70s. But mismanagement of the government of our resources plunged us. That once crude oil prices fell in the early 80s, we had a recession. Mm. And guess what? We normally blame other people for our problems. We blamed other people that came to work in Nigeria for our problems and said, okay, they must leave. After they left, the problem persisted. It led to a military interregnum. Nothing was solved. So we go around the circles with our problems, but we fail to understand that the solution to our problem lies in the verbal verse I quoted this morning. Righteousness mm. exalts a nation. Mm. And sin is a reproach. We need economic righteousness. Economic right thinking. It's economic righteousness that will know that rather than spending $40 billion in the last 10 years of subsidy, you can have as well invested $14 billion year on year in infrastructure, mm. in education, and other parts that can get your country working exactly. and invest in your port and export. Economic righteousness presupposes that you can't have a country where there's an allegation against the, uh, the Accountant General of the Federation for still over $100 billion in a country where ASU is on strike. Mm. Economic righteousness also says that there must be budgetary accountability. We must be able to put a cap on borrowing. Mm. That's economic righteousness. But you see, the sin that creates a reproach, what are the economic sins of Nigeria? Subsidy mm. that people are stealing from bank and center. Corruption in governments. Massive insecurity. It's a righteousness supports it. That's why you see. Come on, preach. Yeah, you know? that, that's why you, you see. Know? That's why you see that people can't resign even when they are in the wrong mm. in this country. Mm. That you have to force them out. So when we are ready, we we'll fix Nigeria. Rotus. The sad reality is I don't think we are ready now. We are still enjoying it. Some people are still benefiting. Oh, oh no, we're ready. Oh, boy. We are ready. I don't think yes. we are ready. Oh, no. Some people are still enjoying it. Continue.